Hi, I'm Elizabeth Bowman, Editor-in-Chief of Opera Canada, and this is the Opera Glasses Podcast, a place to hold discussions that are tougher to editorialize in print and to expand on the current whims of our business. Today, I'm excited to introduce our inaugural guest, Kate Pizzaroni, Founder, Principal, and Art Director of Lenny's Studio, a design, digital marketing, and PR firm that specializes in opera and classical music with team members in Vienna, London, New York, New Jersey, Cleveland, and Montreal. Thanks so much for being here today. I want to circle back to your company's motto, connecting artists and audiences. Can you briefly describe what this means to you? You know, having grown up in the world of opera with all its magic, uh, I always felt like it has to be my mission in life to bring as many people to this art form uh, as possible. And I wanted to communicate in words and visuals that this is very contemporary, very cool and very accessible. So this has probably been at the core of why I started this in the first place in 2003. Speaking of new audiences, what productions would you recommend for a first time opera goer? You know, uh, I talk about this a lot with my friends and I don't like this is very often talked about in the opera world. What is a beginner's opera, quote unquote? And I don't think I believe in this cookie cutter approach that Bohem is a beginner's opera because it's short and, you know, the soprano dies at the end and it's very moving and everybody knows the music. I feel like we should listen to people a little bit more and what their likes and dislikes are. And like, what is your ideal first movie that depends on your likes and dislikes, right? Could be Adam's Family, could be Top Gun, could be a romantic comedy, could be something, you know, some dark European alternative indie film. Um, And certainly from my experience, um, I've brought a lot of people to the opera over the years. And all of my preconceptions have been wrong because one of my developers, uh, I brought him to the opera for the first time and it was Boheme and he thought it was, it was a fun, okay, right? And the second, his second opera was Eugene Onegin, which he already liked a lot more and he felt like it was much, much more interesting. And his third opera ever was... Parsifal in a very old production by Otto Schenk at the Met. And he sent me a two page um, report afterwards, you know, describing every scene and how it touched him so profoundly. And I would have never thought that Parsifal is an opera for someone who has only been to the opera three times prior to that. Right. So I'm saying it's, it's, it depends, right? I think we need to know more about our audiences to make informed recommendations on what their first, second, third, and 49th opera is. Definitely. I think part of it is also whether or not they're connected to something on stage, like whether or not they're engaged um, with something on stage. Like, what do they know about a certain performer? Have they heard that person speak before or have they, you know, seen them in another at a reception somewhere and really connected with them? I think like when you talk about connecting artists and audiences, that's what comes to my mind is this idea that we're missing sometimes this connection between audience and the stage. And um, I, I, I'm curious whether or not your developer had a connection with somebody in that Parsifal or whether or not that was, you know, just like a, a unique experience. I think in that case, it was really just him. The story of Parsifal resonated with him. And I don't know whether he's very religious and this kind of, idea of the grail and salvation resonated with him more deeply than other plots would have possibly done. But he didn't have a connection. He didn't even know anybody in the cast um, other than my dad who was in it. But I think there are examples like you mentioned where this is can be very powerful. Like my dad did Thomas Hampson, for those listeners who do not know that, an American baritone. He did a world premiere at San Francisco Opera called Heart of a Soldier that was the story about the story of uh, one man who had a, was a real life hero who worked for Morgan Stanley as a security guard. And he saved thousands of people from the Twin Towers um, and never emerged from the building himself and died. And he was a Vietnam veteran and San Francisco Opera invited all these veterans to the opera for one of the performances and I was there. And it was really a profound experience how these vets perceived this opera, right? Because a lot, this kind of was about Rick Corridor's life and how 
his time in Vietnam went and then his time in, at the World Trade Center. And you could really see that it was meaningful to these veterans to watch someone on stage who portrayed one of them. And there was an energy in the hall that I will never forget. So speaking of, of expanding our audience base and getting new people into the hall and engaging with our current audience base, because that's something that also needs to happen. What's something that you think companies might have difficulty uh, executing in, in terms of social media marketing? I think there are a couple of relatively easy technical things that could be improved. Um, so many opera companies and concert venues fail to tag the artists uh, when they share things on social media uh, ahead of the concert or in the rehearsal process, meaning a lot of the artists don't necessarily see the content that is being shared and are therefore less likely to reshare it. I think one of the things that is also not as efficient as it could be is I think artists should be provided with some kind of social media cheat sheet at the beginning of a rehearsal process or in the beginning of a production where everyone's social media handles are listed, every cast member, the chorus, the orchestra, the supers, the makeup and hair department and the costumes and whoever else is involved in the production. Um, so to have everyone's social handles, then I think they should be provided with more assets than they are currently provided with, right? So where the opera company shares all of the production photos with the artists much more freely than is currently the case. Because currently um, production photos, it depends on the opera company, but many of them share only two production photos with the artists. That could be a lot more. And I think people would uh, be happy to share these, this content on their channels if they had better assets. Yeah, I'm always surprised at the lack of sort of formal employee uh, responsibility in terms of the social media photos backstage. There's a, a sort of reliance on just the cast to sort of take care of that. But as you know, and as I know from my previous business as a publicist, you know, it's a lot of work and the artists need to focus on what they're doing on stage. So I completely agree with this. There need to be more photos uh, that are readily available and they need to be taken by a good photographer because it's extremely important in terms of having good assets and sharing. Um, of for course. And people. I think generally speaking, venues and opera companies could share content with more humor and somehow take inspiration from other industries and create things that is a little bit more varied than the content that is being currently shown. And I think we see a little, we see too little of the process of what that is like to bring a show on stage. Generally speaking, when artists have teams, they should be connected with, right? Because I think that's an asset that opera companies don't always take advantage of that if one of my artists works at the Met, I would like to collaborate with the Met more closely and see how I can help them to promote the show. Because I think that's easier if it's a if it's a joint effort. If you think about how many people are involved in putting on an opera, they have hundreds of people working there. It's surprising that there's not more sort of um, encouragement or industry responsibility of everybody and their social media sharing the content um, for each production, because that would be, you know, a very, I know other or uh, other businesses do this in other industries. That's absolutely true. And I could not agree more. I think from my experience, I've seen that people are more likely to share it if they have some kind of authorship in it. You know, if they are the costume designer and the social media post is only about the singer, they're very unlikely to share that. But if it's, I think generally speaking, we should broaden what we post about a little bit more and highlight different people contributing to the production in different ways. And then I think if people see themselves in the social media content, they're yeah. much more likely to share it. Okay, so now I really would like to talk about something that's related and in our industry, possibly not used effectively. Uh, what sort of analytical tools do you use uh, to see a campaign's online impact? So we use the the analytics tools that are built into each platform. So I will monitor and my team will monitor how posts are performing on each platform individually and see, you know, what the demographic is of the, of the posts, how many people have shared it, what this impact on social media is. I think we have to make a distinction of the difference between a successful post on social media and a successful 
sales transaction, right? That are two distinctly separate things because it's one thing to get a um, thousand likes because you're showing a lot of skin and people, or it's very humorous or it's something that people find very relatable. And it's another to post something that entices people to actually go and buy a ticket. So I think we always have to find a balance of the two of them because we can't be too serious because that doesn't appeal to people to the extent that we would like them and we need to engage them. But we also need to turn these the, the social media audience into customers who come to the opera and watch a performance. When you uh, use these tools, do you find that promoted posts are, are responded to more effectively than promoted advertisements, straight ads? Yes. We, so we do a lot of promoter posts and we do separate paid advertising campaigns. Paid advertising campaigns are quite expensive per transaction. So it, we only do that for things where that are extremely important or where we have a lot of budget because the per install click sale transaction cost is quite high. Right. So yeah. I believe in the promotion of organic posts every day of the week. For the sort of young artists that are watching, um, I used to encourage people to sort of put in $10 to boost their posts. You know, a lot of them are hesitant and they feel like they're overexposing themselves or looking too narcissistic or something like that. But I think it's just part of the business, right? Like this is just part of it, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Also, um, social media is about self-promotion that we should not be shy about that, that perf performing is also a form of self-promotion. So it's, it's just putting yourself out there, being more visible. Um, when you promote so posts on social media, you have to be mindful though of picking your parameters correctly, right? Because depending on the location and the demographic you're choosing, uh, it can potentially reach a lot of people or it can potentially reach very few people, but perhaps it's more important to reach fewer people that are relevant to your career and to the production that you're currently in than reaching 1000 people in a completely unrelated city across the world. Right. Yeah. So numbers need to be looked at closely. So what's your best example of a campaign you've worked on um, that's reached a new audience and why do you think it was successful? So uh, my example would be Joyce DiDonato's latest world tour called Eden, where we created an entire social media campaign around this tour that highlights each city on social media as well. So where we highlight key um, sites of the city and key plants that are native in this environment. And each city had a children choir participating in the concert at the very end. And there were workshops in most of the cities that Joyce visited. So it was an educational effort in conjunction with uh, a concert experience. And both, both of these things came together. And I thought it was really beautiful to watch how, um, I think we can expand our audience through these children choirs because for them, it was of course an unforgettable experience to participate in the workshops, learn more about native seeds, plant some seeds, and share the stage with, you know, a world star and sing the Eden anthem, which um, was actually written by the kids in an Eden workshop before the tour kicked off. At the very beginning, they wrote the words and a teacher helped them turn this into this beautiful song that is now performed in each of the venues. I think it somehow, we could definitely see that through including all of these children choirs that the demographic of people sharing and liking the post was much younger than it would be for a regular promotion of a concert performance right. or an opera. So you successfully engaged with these children yes. and then that translated into sort of positive results. Your story uh, about this campaign just reminded me of when I was a kid, I did Murray Schaefer's Spirit Garden and it was an outdoor production. And here I am <laughs> in my job, I do this for a living. And so um, working in the opera world, I mean, who knows, like all of these experiences have such profound impacts uh, yes. on on these kids and then our future audience. Like we really need to be focusing on children, education. It's uh, obviously a systemic, a systemic issue. I mean, it, it's, it, we build it from the bottom to the top. So that's really wonderful that, that you worked on that I campaign. I could not agree more. Also, you know, we did this kind of, uh, we've also encouraged the children's choirs to present 
one of their favorite songs, the choice in the rehearsal process. And so all of these children choirs sang different things, you know, depending on the country that they come from. And one of the most beautiful experiences recently was in Linz, where the children's choir of the opera sang Leonard Cohen's Hallelujah for her. And it, they all brought her a rose and it was so moving. And the video went completely viral on Facebook and I think hit over 2 million views in absolutely no time. So, uh, so one of the really fun things is that Joyce really wanted to give each audience member a tangible thing at the end of the opera and felt like it would be beautiful to give people seats. Uh, it's a symbol for, you know, to be an actual seat, a seat of hope, a seat of a new beginning, something that is a positive thing. So we produced these little items that were uh, given to every audience member and there's a QR code in the back. And if you plant this in your garden, it's actually a local seed that can contribute to your own version of Eden on your balcony or on your, your garden or wherever you want. So a lot of people, we've encouraged people to share photos of the plants that have grown from these seeds on social media and tag us. And it's been really beautiful to somehow watch all of these plants grow. That's great. And that's also like a, a constant sort of reminder of that experience. So you really extend the engagement way beyond uh, just that, that one performance. So, um, you know, congratulations. Exactly. That's really, uh, really smart campaign. <laughs> What's something you would like to see more of in our business? Um, in terms of content being shared on social media, I think I've always loved quick fire videos. It's like the Proust questionnaire. It's like people like short formats on social media. So I like to keep it short, fast cuts. And so I, I love quick fire videos. I wish we had more. Um, mm -hmm. I also would like to see more rehearsal footage that is edited, right? Nobody wants to watch a two hour rehearsal footage because it's quite boring. But I think we're some, I would like to watch more of the process rather than just the final product on stage. Um, I like, these kinds of, I don't know, but there are so many moments, I've been to so many rehearsals in my life, and there's always these interesting moments when you feel things come together. And I feel like the audience would really enjoy this process to watch that. And yeah. you know, somehow what, what all the elements, like opera is comprised of so many different components. And I think we, I would like to see movement lessons and diction coachings and costume fittings, you know, whatever seems appropriate for that given production. Yeah, even all this sort of the backstage, I mean, there's so much crazy stuff happening back there. I mean, I, I, um, just like all the, the equipment just coming barreling down while while there's like this beautiful aria <laughs> being performed on the stage. They're just getting ready for the set change. And, um, you know, exactly. uh, I feel like th these things are, are things the audience would love to know um, about, and also the people doing it, um, as you mentioned earlier, like let's engage with more of the people working in the, in, in the industry, um, and, and put the spotlight on them and really find out who's doing these crazy jobs. Exactly. You know? And I think we've also seen that opera houses who do that, for instance, the Mets live in HD broadcasts. I think one of the most popular things is that people can watch the scene changes from above or from the front or whatever. Or yeah. San Francisco Opera does this once in a while where they uh, open the curtain during intermission and people can watch the set changes. And I think it's really interesting because people do not know how difficult that is and how technical and how many people are involved in moving these massive pieces of scenery across the stage. It's exciting. Is there a campaign that you've admired in any uh, other industry? It could be opera, but it could be any industry. I've lately admired all of the Nike commercials. Um, because, so for instance, I saw a billboard in San Francisco uh, that I found really interesting because it would be expected that you're, if you're a sports company that I'm seeing an athlete run or somebody uh, throw a basketball or a shoe or something. And it was just a typographic treatment of um, a list of motivational statements like never done moving, never done losing, never done dreaming, never done showing up. And I feel like it's a very good example of something that opera should replicate, right? Because where are we in the opera business or are we in the people business? Are we in the enlightenment business? Are we in the joy business? And I think Nike has somehow 
done a very good job of not only being in the sports business. Uh, one thing that I really admire about Nike is their exactly what you're saying, this um, engagement um, with the everyday person. Uh, I started running on the Nike Run Club app and it's for anyone. I'm not advertising it, but um, you brought up Nike. <laughs> but, but I'm just, I'm so amazed because it's a free app and it gets people moving of all levels and it's completely free. And you're, you're never, uh, you, you don't have to have Nikes to, to do it. And, but they're, they understand that they are creating community and that that will that will turn into um, a return on, on investment. Like it's just, they create these exactly. programs, they have all these taglines, but their, their focus is clearly on creating the community. And that's exactly, exactly, exactly what we all need to be doing. So, um, and also Dan Whedon, who, who um, did the um, Just Do It for Nike, um, he, just, he just passed away. So um, I was reading about that in the New York Times the other day. So that's very timely that you would bring up Nike. Anyway. Um, yeah. They just, it's super inspirational. And I think opera, we, we in classical music in general, we are in the inspiration business, right? Our job is to transport people into another state of being and into another state of mind, heart, spirit, whatever you want to call it, for two hours or three hours. So they can be lifted up, be inspired to have more fulfilled lives. Clearly we, we have a takeaway from Nike. We, we have community to build and I think we need to be focusing on that engagement with the stage, as you say, and connecting audiences with artists um, and vice versa. Do you have any other ideas like ways to engage um, that are being used in other businesses? What do you think? We could do better in the audience onboarding or in the experience that after you have bought the tickets, because I feel like there's still a lot of uncertainty about people, what for people, what they can expect at a performance. So I feel like we should play with sending people text messages, right? How to prepare for an opera. Here's your one minute video greeting of a cast member inviting you to the show and telling you what their favorite moment of the opera is, because I feel like we're asking a lot of people uh, to read a two-page plot summary of operas that are very often very complicated. You know, the, the plot of Le Notte di Figaro is something that I still don't fully understand, and I've seen it <laughs> 300 times. No, I understand it, but I'm saying it's reading the summary. It's not something that is particularly, I don't know, that does not lead you to a richer experience of the opera. So I feel like a one-minute audio excerpt or a video invite or possibly some fun facts about the opera experience in total, right? We always take things for granted and we're so snobby about uh, what we expect people to know. And I think people should be reminded that there are super titles. You will understand what this is about, even if you do not speak Italian. Voices are unamplified. This is very different from a regular pop concert. Uh, where can I park? There are themed cocktails available at intermission. You can enjoy mm -hmm. them here. Here are some um, things that you could do after the opera. If you really enjoyed the notes of the Figaro, maybe you want to explore Don Giovanni next or something like that. Just give people some next steps, right? Or listen to this playlist that this director has compiled for you, which deals with other things inspired by Beaumarchais. I think right. we or like other books or something. And I think there are a lot of things that we could do better at or to somehow build more of a community. And I think we can, there are two ways I think of, of, of growing the audience. One is through young people, kids, students. Um, and that's extremely important. And we can do that through opening dress rehearsals and by bringing artists to schools, because I have, been part of um, a couple of these experiences where schools were invited to attend a dress rehearsal at the Metropolitan Opera, for instance. And I think what is not always done and what I think is an essential part of this experience for these students is that they have a Q&A with the artists afterwards. Because I think this moment of connection with the person is almost more memorable to them than just watching a performance where they're 
sitting quite far away from the stage and they're just immersed in this theatrical experience. But if they can ask the performers a couple of questions, it'll be, you know, a once in a lifetime experience for some of them. And mm -hmm. I think the second thing that we could do better is to build community by building more social gatherings, right? By having these young professional clubs and maybe some can be also for older people where a lot of people are lonely in this city and every city. There should be a way for people to be part of this kind of club where they can, it's like a book club where people can share things together and talk about those afterwards or before, um, go to dinner, you know, sign up for some kind of experience that can be, you know, shared with other people. Yeah. I mean, I would love to get a text message from the opera presenter and learn about these people um, as people. So that goes back to the engaging with what you're about to see. And also, I think in terms of the enjoyment of opera, there's some element of engaged entertainment. So it's not like you sit back and just let it happen to you. You sort of have to have some involvement in, right. in what is going to happen in order to enjoy it to the the level that um, people obviously do enjoy it. And so we need to sort of crack open that layer. Um, and I think it's relatively easy, as you say, like if we do send these text messages and um, and show people the different sides and and have these social clubs. And yes. these are all, all really, really wonderful ideas. So thank you so much for being here and sharing your ideas. And I hope opera companies and artists are, are listening and, uh, and start practicing them. <laughs> thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. I always love talking about new ways to connect artists and audience.